We start lecture 13 by talking about the Bohr atomic model of the atom. In particular, we're going to derive the Rydberg Balmer equation. Now, I'm going to show a little bit of the physics aspect of this model. All right, so you may remember that in terms of describing the atom, Rutherford performed his gold foil experiment that allowed the description of the atom as being that of positive charge concentrated in a tiny region of space within the atom known as the nucleus. And the neutrons were also shown to be there by Chadwick's work. Um, the electrons there were thought of being orbiting the nucleus, much like planets orbit the sun. All right, so this is the initial premise that Bohr utilizes. So he says, okay, fine, we're gonna look at the interaction of the electron to the nucleus as being that of an orbiting motion, uh, a motion that can be described by angular um, forces. So the angular force associated with the attraction of the electron to the nucleus is given by mv squared over r. This is something learned in circular motion in physics. And because the electron has a negative charge and the nucleus has a positive charge, you have a Coulombic attraction. Uh, one between the negative charge of the electron, the positive charge of the nucleus, and the distance you know, between them. And because these two ways of thinking about the attraction of the electron to the nucleus are in essence just describing that attraction and nothing else, they have to be equal to each other. Now notice that if we cross multiply by r, we will partially cancel out the r's in the equation. right? So I'm going to cross multiply by r, and I'm also going to cross multiply by m. Uh, so divide by m, multiply by r on both sides of the equation. The r's and the m's cancel out on the left side. Uh, some of the r's cancel out, the m resides on the right side of the equation. So now the velocity square equals the product of the charges divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. This is the permissivity of free space, a constant, uh, divided by the mass of the electron and the radius, the distance between the electron and the nucleus. All right, now here we use once again the premise that the total energy must equal kinetic energy plus potential energy. And specifically, kinetic energy from the classical point of view is equal to one half mv squared. The potential energy, if we concentrate on the Coulombic attractions, is simply the product of the charges divided by 4 pi epsilon r. Okay, and what you can see right here is that, okay, this is looking kind of nice because the potential energy term looks very much like the speed square term that we isolated here on the left side. So basically, we're going to take this term and substitute it for V square in the kinetic energy model. And what you will see is that the masses will cancel out. Now what you have is technically the QE, QC over 4 pi epsilon r multiply by one half and because this is negative technically this is negative one half plus one integral value of qe qc over four pi epsilon r in other words one minus one half which is positive one half qe qc over four pi epsilon r this is the total energy term in terms of the charges of the electron and the nucleus and the distance between them now the only issue with this is that we don't have a good way of measuring that distance experimentally so we're going to try to substitute it with a few other terms and specifically i want to bring your attention to the idea that the wavelength is equal to 2 pi and that because every 2 pi terms you complete one full oscillation of a wave um, pretty much Bohr makes the assumption that if we're going to use quantum mechanics we need to make the energy discrete. And it seems most reasonable to make the energy match up in terms of wavelength to the, um, to, to the wavelength via the Braille's equation. So uh, pretty much the idea that this entire circumference through which the electron is you know, orbiting the nucleus that entire circumference has to equal multiples of the wavelength in order to work out via quantum mechanics. And the moment this happens, 
this value of n, this is actually one of the quantum numbers known as the principal quantum number, um, gets introduced in the equation. So this is actually going to have some importance for us in a little bit. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, further substitutions. The wavelength we know via uh, the Braga's equation is equal to Planck's constant over the wavelength, excuse me, over the momentum. So I'm going to substitute that in here. And solving for r simply gets us to n times Planck's constant divided by 2 pi times the momentum. Okay, so we are getting somewhere. Now we have an expression for the radius, which is part of the total energy equation. Okay, so if we were to substitute what we have solved for the radius into the equation up here, we we'll end up with 2 pi momentum divided by nh. Okay, and uh, the pi's are going to cancel out, the 2's are going to cancel out, so this ends up reducing to the following term, which is not any better than what we had originally because we had radius, which is not easy to determine, and now we have momentum, which is not the greatest thing to have either. But two things that have happened is that now we have introduced Planck's constant and a new quantum number into the equation. So now we have quantized the total energy. All right, let's take a look at the momentum a little bit more in detail. Momentum, as you may remember from our discussion of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is mass times velocity. And right here, Right above it, we know that the velocity square equals this entire term. So what I'm going to do is square the momentum. Square the momentum means that we square the mass and we square the velocity. But we know that the velocity square is negative QEQC over 4 pi epsilon MR. So we're going to substitute that for V square. And now we partially cancel out the masses. So we find out that the momentum squared is equal to negative QEQC ME over 4 pi epsilon R, but we know that R is equal to NH divided by 2 pi momentum. So we're substituting that whole term for the radius over here. And when we do that, we end up with NH on the bottom of the fraction, 2 pi times momentum on top, and the beauty of this is that now we have momentum squared on the left side, momentum to the first power on the right side. So we basically divide by mom the momentum. We cancel out the square on the left side. And yes, we get rid of the pi term from this thing and the two as well. So the momentum now has a new expression. And the beauty of this expression is that it represents nothing more than a collection of constants. The charge of the electron, the charge of the nucleus, the mass of the electron, the permissivity of space, Planck's constant, and the quantum number. That's the only variable here, the quantum number. Um, so we're going to go ahead and input this whole thing into the total energy equation that we have here on the left side. All right, so here we go. So we input all of that for rho, and what happens is that we have QE times QE, which will be square, QC times QC, which will be square, um, and H and N will also be square. So we're going to end up with the following thing. You might think that this looks pretty ugly, and to some degree it does look kind of ugly. But remember, everything except for n is a constant. So ultimately we're going to, we're going to get a number multiplied by 1 over n squared. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to do now, if you look carefully, the charge of the nucleus is basically the number of protons the nucleus has times the charge of the electron. So I'm going to get that out of here. Um, basically say, okay, this is just charge of the electron square times the number, the atomic number in the nucleus square. And altogether, if you remove the atomic number and the quantum number n out of the equation, now the collection of constants, the charge of the electron to the fourth power times the mass of the electron divided by eight times the permissivity of free space square times Planck's constant square, and you actually plug in the values, you're going to find out that this entire set of constants is nothing more than 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. And that gets multiplied by the atomic number of the element in question squared divided by the principal quantum number squared. Uh, now, this will be the absolute energy. But what we typically end up measuring in chemicals is not the absolute energy 
energy, but rather the changes in energy of the system. Um, and what that means is that ultimately we're going to look at the differences in energy from one initial state to a final state. Uh, one thing that I will say here for simplification purposes is that the 2.18 times 10 to negative 18 joules is a constant known as the Balmer constant, and I'm going to use the letter B to represent it. Notice also the negative sign in front, um, which is part of the derivation. Uh, all right, so now looking at the differences in energy, since B is going to be a constant, Z will be a constant because the atom is not going to change itself. Uh, the only thing that can change is the principal quantum number. So what we're going to have is the following equation in order to get the changing energy. 1 over m final square minus 1 over n initial square multiplied by negative bz square. This is known as the riddle balmer equation. And in the next video, I will show you how to use this equation for calculations of electronic transitions.